Uh, welcome to the Radical Health Summer Lecture Series. This is week seven. And my name is Timothy Byers. I'm the president of Radical Health and the director of cannabis programs at Pacific College of Health and Science. And I'm also joined tonight by Radical Health CEO and palliative care uh, nurse practitioner at Stanford Healthcare, Eloise Thiessen. Uh, the summer lecture series, uh, it's eight 20 minute lectures. It covers a range of cannabis healthcare and industry topics. Uh, Eloise and I have been providing these lectures most Thursdays throughout the summer. Um, we have this one and we have one left in the first week of August. We are taking next week off. So please be aware of that. Um, we do send out weekly reminders. So we'll continue to send out reminders for, uh, for week eight. Uh, that's gonna be the week of um, it's August 10th. Um, so if you're not part of the radical community or on our email list, please be sure that you uh, join the community. The radical community is comprised of advocates and educators and healthcare professionals, cannabis stakeholders. And what we want to do is we want to provide support, information, and resources to our members. So uh, if you want information about how to join, just go to our website, radicalhealthcare.com. Click the community link. It's free to sign up. It doesn't cost anything. It just simply adds you to our email list and uh, it enables you to stay informed about um, any of our future events. Uh, and then finally, I want to remind everyone that uh, we also have an array of curriculum options at a range of price points for students and working professionals. You know, whether you are uh, helping customers at a, at a, in retail or maybe you're, um, you know, making sure that they're making good product choices, if you're treating patients, if you're advocating for social change, maybe you're just using cannabis yourself, you need evidence-based factual information about cannabis. Radical Health Curricula is up to date, it's comprehensive, and it's informed by both clinical experience and expertise and instructional design experience and expertise. So please reach out to us uh, for information or just simply click one of the education links on our website. Uh, this presentation is for educational purposes only and the information presented today is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. This information is not meant to help in the diagnosis, prognosis, or treatment of any virus, disease, illness, or condition. So if you have any questions uh, about the lecture today, uh, please put them in the chat or hold them until the end. Uh, we should have about five to 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. So let's get started. So today our lecture is titled uh, Fermented Cannabinoids, but the topic really includes any type of cannabinoid that is produced biosynthetically. So what do we mean by that? Typically, there are three methods that are used to produce cannabinoid extracts. So you have plant-based extraction. This is, of course, for you know, the process where phytochemicals are extracted directly from harvested plant material. This is the most commonly used method of cannabinoid production. But you also have chemical synthesis and biosynthesis. Now, chemical synthesis and biosynthesis can be discussed collectively under the umbrella term synthetic production. Um, given that we're talking about fermented cannabinoids today, we're not really gonna talk much about plant-based extraction processes or really about chemical synthesis either, except to provide some points of comparison. So um, let's, uh, let's dive a little bit more in depth uh, into what, uh, what the biosynthetic production of cannabinoids looks like. So, all chemical compounds are comprised of atoms and they're connected by chemical bonds. And, and the type and number of atoms and their connections are kind of like the fingerprints of compounds. It's what makes compounds unique. And typically the synthetic production of a specific compound will require chemists to break some of those uh, existing bonds and to also form new bonds because they're trying to make a different compound. Um, so they, they have to expose that compound um, to some other agent or to a catalyst to cause a reaction uh, and to create some change uh, in, you know, among the configuration of atoms. So the synthesis of a complex molecule, like a cannabinoid, includes a considerable and a varied number of required reactions or changes. And chemists can use different methods to cause a reaction. So for example, some of these bonds between atoms can be influenced if you just simply apply heat. Um, some bonds respond to the exposure to ultraviolet light. Um, sometimes you can change the 
um, the, the way that two atoms bind um, by adding a, an electric current. Essentially, chemists are attempting to mimic the processes that occur in nature to construct chemical compounds through these controlled reactions. Um, remember when we talked about uh, Delta-8 THC in our, our radical community lecture, um, chemists, in, in order to convert CBD to Delta-8, um, ch chemists are dissolving that CBD in a solvent that's causing a reaction. They're boiling that mixture in acid and that's causing the, the atoms to break apart and form new bonds. Um, they, then they cool that, um, that reaction, they neutralize the acid, they extract the solvent. All of these are the steps um, to, to cause the required and intended reactions to create that new compound, to turn CBD into Delta-8 THC. Both chemical synthesis and biosynthesis are processes where controlled chemical reactions using two or more agents are combined to produce a desired compound. So no plant material is required here. These are cannabinoids that are created in a laboratory. And again, we're not really discussing chemical synthesis today. If you wanna learn more about um, synthetic cannabinoid production through chemical synthesis, you can look at our synthetic cannabinoid module on our Thinkific website. Uh, I'll simply note that it typically involves two or more non-biological or non-living compounds. And they're combined in a controlled chemical reaction, again, to take something and to turn it into something else. You have a uh, desired output that they're looking to, uh, to produce and you're, you're working with non-biological compounds. Biosynthesis, on the other hand, refers to reactions that occur in a living organism. All biological systems have mechanisms to catalyze reactions, including enzymes that uh, can initiate and facilitate chemical reactions, and then also the energy that's required to drive these reactions to completion. So biosynthesis in the context of synthetic cannabinoid production refers to the use of a, a biological or a living organism as an agent in the controlled chemical reaction, again, to yield that desired output, or in our case, the desired cannabinoid. Biosynthesis, one of the inputs used in the, in the chemical reaction, at least one, is living. It's a biological organism. And usually that input is a simple organism. It's something like a bacteria or a fungus, something like you know maybe yeast or algae. So these living organisms are the engine that uh, for the chemical reaction because they produce their own enzymes uh, uh, to catalyze the reactions. And a, and a simple example of biosynthesis is the process for alcohol production, the one that we all know and love, right? We have sugar from grains or fruits, it's combined with water and yeast, and the yeast metabolizes the sugar, it processes the sugar for energy uh, in the fermentation process, and the byproduct of that metabolism, of that fermentation is carbon dioxide and alcohol and, and a little bit of heat. It's a, it's a simple process with inputs that are naturally available. You cannot produce compounds as, as complex as cannabinoids using only naturally produced inputs. So to produce cannabinoids using a, a biosynthetic process, you have to start with a biological organism that's been genetically modified. So changes are made to the organism so that its, its cells produce the specific enzymes that are required to create the biological curse, precursor to cannabinoids. So this, when, they, when they genetically modify a, a yeast or an algae, they're basically, these chemists are basically hijacking the organism's natural chemical processes, again, to create a desired output. In this case, it's usually a single cannabinoid. And this field of research, it's uh, the, the engineering and modification of biological organisms, systems and processes is called synthetic biology. And it's a field that's changing the manner in which commercial compounds are produced, not only cannabinoids, but also pharmaceuticals, consumables, industrial items, wellness products. It's, it's really expanding very quickly. So just to put a final point on the, the chemistry of biosynthetic production of cannabinoids, let's consider a, a very basic description of how cannabis plants produce uh, cannabinoids. So cannabis plants, they extract CO2 out of the atmosphere. They use that CO2 to form sugar. Uh, then the plant uses those sugars through a number of um, different enzymatic conversions to eventually create 
CGB or CBGA or CBGV. These are the biological precursors to most cannabinoids. So in the slide here, you can see uh, these enzymatic processes that convert glucose to CBGA. And on the, on the left side, you can see glucose at the top. Uh, that's converted into glycerol dehyde three phosphate, and that's converted into pyruvate, which is converted into acetyl coenzyme A. And then the Krebs cycle kind of gets involved there. And frankly, unless you're a biochemist or a molecular biologist, you probably don't maybe know what's going on in this graphic. And that's the point. Um, the process involved in reactions to convert glucose to CBGA are complex. So when determining how to biosynthesize cannabinoids, chemists have to determine how to replicate these steps, starting with a, a living molecule, or they have to determine where in the series of these steps, they can insert some genetic material to subsequently produce the same process to create the biological precursor to cannabinoids. It's complex. So how would a company make cannabinoids from yeast? Like if they're gonna ferment cannabinoids, how, how would they do that? So typically most companies, they just, they purchase commercially available synthetically produced DNA sequences of the enzymes in cannabis that are the biological precursors to cannabinoids and cannabinoid production. They insert that DNA into uh, that DNA sequence uh, into yeast cells, and, and this effectively reprograms the yeast cell. Uh, there are multiple approaches and techniques to doing this, and companies develop and patent these techniques, and they're considered trade secrets. So the, the modified yeast cultures are, are then placed into large tanks, and um, that's where they ferment, uh, hopefully multiplying and producing large amounts of the desired cannabinoid. It takes about five days. And then they remove the yeast slurry, uh, they extract the cannabinoids, they isolate them and they purify them. So that's really um, a very high level and conceptual overview of how a chemist might ferment a genetically engineered organism to eventually produce a cannabinoid. Which brings us to this fundamental question, why? Why do we need fermented cannabinoids? Cannabis plants are metabolic factories. They produce scores of different molecular compounds, over 100 different cannabinoids alone, over 400 other chemical compounds. If the cannabis plant is so prolific at naturally producing secondary metabolites, why do we need fermented cannabinoids? Initially, all synthetic cannabinoids were developed for, for research, mostly. You know, we had legal restrictions that limited the availability of plant-derived cannabinoids, and it really forced researchers to develop similar, similar compounds and, and analogs to, to cannabinoids. But more recently, businesses see profit-related reasons for developing biosynthetic cannabinoids because they offer some unique advantages over plant-derived cannabinoids. So from a commercial perspective, you know, the goal is to produce cannabinoids cheaply and efficiently and reliably, and this can be really difficult to do by conventional plant cultivation. You know, the, the startup costs of biomanufacturing are quite high, but in the near future, the cost of mass producing synthetic cannabinoids in a bioreactor will likely be far cheaper than traditional cannabis plant farming. Uh, cannabis cultivation, especially at commercial scale, is land and capital intensive. Uh, greenhouses and indoor grow facilities at commercial scale can cost tens of millions of dollars to build and operate. Also, biomanufacturing enables a consistency that's impossible to replicate in plants. Uh, it offers repeatability. Uh, every batch has the potential to be consistent in content and purity. Um, these cannabinoids that are produced in this manner, they're not influenced by weather, they're not influenced by pests, they require less energy than indoor uh, grown cannabis, and biosynthetic cannabinoids can be patented, uh, and companies are reticent to invest in the research and development of a therapeutic substance uh, if there are no guarantees that their intellectual property won't be protected. From a pharmacology perspective, Biosynthetic cannabinoids offer researchers an opportunity to improve the potency, the affinity, and the efficacy of cannabinoids. So, for example, many companies are looking to develop a cannabinoid that has 
very high affinity at CB2, but very low affinity at CB1, which would you know, help consumers benefit from the therapeutic properties of CB2 activation, so anti-inflammation and pain mitigation, um, while avoiding the side effects of, of CB1 activation. So you know, when we talk about side effects of CB1, we're almost always talking about psychoactivity. From a medical perspective, Oops. Um, biosynthetic approaches to cannabinoids can help facilitate the creation of products that include cannabinoids that uh, rarely occur naturally or that are difficult to extract. Um, so this offers, you know, this can offer new therapeutic possibilities. Um, some companies, whether it's right or wrong, are creating completely new cannabinoid-like molecules that are not found in nature. So, you know, mass produced biosynthetic versions of CBG and CBC and THCV and Delta-8 and CBN and other cannabinoids will provide new opportunities for research, product development, and novel approaches to treating disease. Fermented cannabinoids also address a growing issue in the cannabis space, its carbon footprint. You know, a million square foot greenhouse growing cannabis plants may yield somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 metric tons of cannabinoids per year. A fermentation facility of the same footprint could generate roughly a thousand metric tons over the same period. Lab grown cannabinoids require less water, they require less energy, and they obviously require less land than their plant grown uh, counterparts. And there are a lot of companies now who are attempting to produce cannabinoids from yeast and bacteria and algae. Uh, for example, in September of 2018, the Kronos Group, this is a global cannabinoid research technology and product development company. They announced a partnership with Ginkgo Bioworks in Boston to develop cannabinoids from a yeast fermentation. Uh, InMed Pharmaceuticals, they're located in Vancouver. Uh, they focus on the development of cannabinoid-derived pharmaceuticals. They're developing a biosynthetic manufacturing process using fermentation with genetically modified E. coli bacteria. Another company that is attempting to produce cannabinoids from yeast or from a strain of E. coli is uh, Tiwanot Life Sciences. Another company is Willow Biosciences. They're making a yeast-derived CBD. There's a company called Intrexon that licensed their proprietary yeast fermentation platform to the cannabis company Certera Wellness for $100 million. There's a company called Demetrix. Uh, they're, they're here in Berkeley, California. They announced that they, uh, they've modified a baker's yeast to produce several cannabinoids. Uh, and then also they've produced novel cannabinoids that they say don't exist in nature. So I wanna be clear that I'm not necessarily advocating for biosynthetic production. Uh, and certainly not everyone in the cannabis space is on board with biosynthetic production. Uh, this is uh, Ethan Rousseau. Uh, he's pointed out that DNA modification is difficult, it's expensive, it requires years of research and development to perfect. Uh, and he stated that he thinks that organic cannabis farming will remain competitive with biosynthetic processes. He said, basically, uh, this is a quote, it's environmentally taxing to grow cannabis inside, but really that's a byproduct of prohibition, end quote. He's also fond of stating simply, the plant does it better. Um, one of his criticisms uh, of biosynthetic production is that a single genetically modified organism can usually only produce one and at most two different cannabinoids. And if these companies are thinking about pharmaceutical development, the product is gonna to have to come from one species. Uh, otherwise the regulatory process will be too complicated and costly. This is a bit of a weird um, uh, argument because you know whole plant cannabis contains over 400 compounds and, and a whole plant cannabis product will certainly never navigate the FDA regulatory process. Um, but he also points out that, um, you know, in, in the cannabis plant, cannabinoids are stored in trichomes, right? So they're stored away from the plant material because the secondary metabolites are actually toxic to the plant. And high concentrations of cannabinoids might also be toxic to yeast. So there might actually be an inherent ceiling of production built into uh, biosynthetic processes. Uh, nevertheless, uh, given the pace at which the industry is moving, given the demand for products and the advancement in new product development, 
it's predictable that the industry will see a significant increase in demand for cannabinoid extracts and for cannabinoid isolates. And in many sectors, the demand will not be limited to quantity. Some of that demand will require better standards of quality, production, and specificity, especially when considering derivative products, products in which cannabinoids are used as an ingredient, uh, such as you know, beverages, foods, wellness products. You know, the, the example that I always like to give is uh, Coca-Cola or McDonald's. You know, when, when they introduce cannabinoids into a product, and I promise you that they will, um, they're not going to be sourcing cannabinoids from a cannabis farmer in Humboldt County. They're going to require massive amounts of product. They're going to want the same product every single time with no variables, and they will insist on consistency and purity. And then research in pharmaceutical products. You know, when cannabinoids actually do start to navigate the FDA process, they're going to require even higher standards of production and consistency. And the, the demand required by these markets will likely be met by biosynthetically produced cannabinoids. So in conclusion, we, we have what I might consider these four different segments in the cannabis market. We have adult use, we have medical, we have hemp derived or, or unregulated uh, cannabis products and cannabinoid pharmaceuticals. And there's been significant progress in all of these segments and growth. Uh, and there will be an increasing demand for extracts and isolates uh, first, the market will demand simply more. It's going to need more of these things. And as more states adopt legal cannabis mark models, and as federal laws change uh, and widespread industry standards are adopted, the market will also require more rigorous standards of quality, uh, production processes, and specificity. And I think it's very likely that derivative products, again, where cannabinoids are only an ingredient, um, it will comprise an increasing share of total sales relative to things like cannabis flower or whole plant products. That's all I have for you today. Uh, we still have about eight minutes, so happy to take uh, comments or questions.